So we're just going to go down the panel, and I'd love everyone to introduce yourself and talk about what your company does and how you guys are using AI today. So I'll kick it off with Leisha. All right. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Leisha Lee. I'm the founder and CEO of Rosebud AI. We're building the AI Roblox. So what that means in particular is how Roblox you know, has created a really um, easy to use platform to build and enjoy games. We want to take AI as a primitive very seriously and not only generate assets, but the actual game creation process itself with generative, in particular, LLMs and also image and multimodal models. All right, AI games after my heart here. All right, Chun. All right, hey everyone. Uh, my name is Chun Xiang. I'm the co founder of Monterey AI. Uh, we help SaaS companies to auto aggregate user feedback from multiple channels and then to auto generate user insight for product teams to understand the pain points so the companies can focus on proactively solving uh, user trend and improve engagement. All right, thank you. Meta. Hey everyone, my name is Meta. I'm the co founder of Defog.ai. Uh, developers use Defog to add an AI data assistant to their apps. So if you're the user of a fintech app, uh, you can just analyze complex financial trends by just asking questions in natural language. And how that works is that when a user types in a question, Defog translates that natural language question into a SQL statement and then returns the answer to that question in a chat-like format. Awesome. And finally, Caroline. Yeah, hi all. I'm Caroline Zane, CEO and co-founder of Notex. We're a health technology company, and what we do is we automatically create the visit notes with billing codes from doctor-patient conversations. So how this works is, you know, you're a patient, you walk into the doctor's office, uh, we'll capture all the conversation, so this is ambient listening, and we'll pull out uh, from the conversation relevant medical entities, put that into the medical format into a SOAP note, and also add the billing codes for our diagnostic and procedural codes. Um, this is really helpful because, as you, many of you know, maybe physicians are, and nurses and providers are experiencing a lot of burnout, worse than during the pandemic, and there are also a lot of revenue uh, cycle management problems. Awesome. So, Caroline, we'll start with you. Okay. How does the product work? Like, do I bring my phone into the doctor's office? You know, how do you deal with privacy issues? Are you guys putting little microphones around uh, exam rooms? Like, you know, how, do, how would I use your product today? Yeah, definitely. So I think the great uh, benefit now is that AI is, uh, is to the level where we can use it in a very um, non-intrusive, you know, patient-friendly, clinical-friendly uh, application. So it's really just on like the mobile phone or the laptop, and physicians frequently bring that into either, you know, into most visit settings, outpatient, inpatient, um, and you just, you know, leave it on and you press record and stop and uh, our algorithm will process and spit the note back out to them. Okay, so given you guys have, I assume, you know, recording, transcription, you have to pull the information out of that, you have to summarize the information, what are kind of all the different pieces of the stack you're using right now? What's working well? What could be working better, I guess? Yeah, uh, well, so the stack is there's a level where, you know, obviously the UI interface, we have to be friendly with the user experience. Physicians are not the easiest to work with. I think um, healthcare is one of, I mean, they are, they're not the easiest. <laughs> Depends on the physician, I guess. I don't know. Okay. I think are they hard to sell to or hard to work with or both? I think it's the level of tech savviness, right? Okay. We have right. some physicians right. who are very tech savvy, but the great benefit now with you know, Cerebral Valley and generative AI is that it's really penetrating to our users as well. Um, so there's that, and then there's, of course, we have a transcription model, we have a generation model as well, too. So from a conversation, we're analyzing essentially the dialogue for the clinical vocabulary and pulling that out. Um, so running that locally, and also same thing for our generative model, too, to put that into subjective, history of present illness, objective assessment plan. So that's essentially the stack. Are you building your own models for summary, for you know transcription, or are you using some third-party services? Yeah, I, I mean, there's a great number of services out here. I think many of the people <laughs> here today, I, I, we're testing, you obviously, use their servers, with OpenAI, testing with Anthropic, testing with Hugging Face, and you know SageMaker as well. But um, what we found really works for us is that we have our local proprietary models augmented by clinical data that we have. So that's important for us because we want it to be reliable, number one, as well as accurate and scalable. Okay, very cool. And you mentioned just in the last, what, three months, six months, 12 months, you feel like doctors are getting excited about AI, you feel like they're sort of penetrated the zeitgeist, like is it getting easier to sell your product to people? Yeah, for sure. So 
Uh, you know, the context behind our company is that my co-founder and I used to work as medical scribes, so we know that doctors used to not be as savvy and aware about the potential of these technologies today. But now doctors are like, oh, well, what is ChatGPT or OpenAI? And that helps us a lot in explaining our product and selling. Okay. So uh, things are getting easier because the narrative is progressing sort of throughout yeah. society. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's pretty interesting. Um, so moving on to Defog, um, sounds... I basically played around with your website for uh, you know, 10, 20 minutes. It seems like I could just ask natural language questions of my database. Is that kind of a good way to summarize it? Yeah. OK. And so who are your top users? Like, who, Which companies do you feel like this is really fitting in with? Yeah, I think we, we've gotten a surprising amount of inbound from a lot of enterprise companies. And that's been really interesting because people are coming to uh, us. Um, they, they're clearly um, looking for ways to inject AI into their products. Um, and let their customers be able to just ask those questions in natural language. Uh, so uh, we do have a bunch of like early stage uh, customers as well, from seed, to, uh, seed stage to Series A and um, further on as well. But uh, I think we're really excited about the pilots that we're starting to do with enterprise companies too. And are you selling into like data teams? Like who's who's your target customer? Like who are you going after, and what's working with them? Yeah, so uh, we're mainly speaking to three groups, data teams, engineering teams, and product teams, depending on sort of what, um, it depends on the company, essentially, but it's typically those three teams. And sorry, what was the second part of your question? I was just asking, like, who is it really hitting with? Like, who do you feel like is getting excited about it when you're trying to sell to them? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, they're all excited. Um, that's, that's why they're talking to us. All right, easy, us. okay, no um, problem. But I think, <laughs> I think um, what's been um, really hitting um, for us is that, you know, we're abstracting away a lot of that schlep work of fine-tuning those models and making it easy to integrate with their front-end um, and back-end. Um, I think another point that uh, is really important for people is that we're privacy preserving, so we don't touch your customer's data, data itself. We just use the metadata from your database okay. to train, uh, fine tune our model to understand your company's context. Interesting, and so what are the most popular types of questions people ask of their database? Like what are you finding, like oh my gosh, like it turns out 80% of what people wanna know is, is X, Y, and Z. Uh, that's, that's. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, it's, it's been all sorts of things. I mean, give you, I'll give you an example of types of companies that are using us. It's been very varied, right? So from like manufacturing analytics, uh, operations teams who want to know like what's happening on the production line to uh, marketing analytics, uh, uh, e-commerce companies wanting to know how their ad spend is doing and how their uh, retail performance is going uh, to, uh, yeah, like govern analytics spaces specifically for governments and universities who are very sensitive about sharing data and letting uh, government officials and university administrators query that data in natural language. Okay, so if I'm, if I'm working on e-commerce marketing, can I basically type a query in saying like, what was my highest performing ad creative yesterday or something like that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can ask a question like that. That's a fairly sort of si one of the simpler questions. The more complex questions is, you know, the ones that require uh, the model to do joins across multiple tables. Uh, that ones are, the they're ones that are asking you to compute something like year and year growth or month and month growth. And we're able to sort of handle more and more of those complex uh, use cases now. Are, are data teams worried that they're going to be replaced by a super easy to use tool like this? No, not at all, I think. Um, I think we're essentially making data teams a lot more productive, right? Okay. I mean, uh, I think one of the lines that one of our customers used with us is that we're their first line of defense against like inane questions from uh, users. <laughs> so I think they, they want to focus on the cool projects and let okay. us do the uh, hard work. So this is the best way to handle inane data questions. All right. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure I've never asked any of those, so that sounds good. Um, moving on to Chuan. Yeah. So. What's your question? I mean, I'm interested. We have customer support. I read email every day. Um, you know, how does this make our life easier, basically, in terms of filtering all the inbound email we get, uh, you know, complaining about our games and how we got a trivia question wrong and someone's upset about it? Yeah, awesome. Uh, yeah, so our primary users are product operations team and okay. customer voice team uh, in SaaS companies, mostly in PLG and open source company, actually. Uh, what we do is like we build integration and native integration with like all the, your social channels, your like CRM, uh, your communication channels like Discord or Slack and then review sites, pull everything together, identify the similarity between uh, each like feedback, we call that feedback, I need a better term for that unit. 
and then to help you understand, like, hey, these are the clusters and these are the themes that users are care about uh, for this month or for this week. Got it. And can I generate responses at scale using this tool, or? Yes. Yes. So we okay. do have this kind of generated emails and generated questions for uh, product managers, uh, especially. If like we identify this user is giving us like some weird just complaint and very vague, we will generate some like bunch of questions for product managers to ask more, like dive deeper to understand. Okay, what is this user frustrating about? Uh, and then when the product managers or in the product teams solve like this bunch of like theme or feedback, uh, we are also like notifying the users saying, hey, like you submitted this feedback about like two months ago. We already solved that. Please come back and check us out again. Okay, got it. At what point do you think you can automate like a huge portion of kind of outbound customer support using this tool? Um, I wouldn't call us like to be set into kind of like customer support okay, all right, all right. industry. Feedback uh, specifically. Think, yeah, so our target users are like product teams uh, who wanted to understand better about users uh, to improve their product. Uh, automating, I don't know. I feel like every day I find like, holy shit, like my previous job probably gonna be replaced by <laughs> looking at this tool. But um, you're like ahead of the curve, so it's good. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I guess. Uh, yeah, so there are definitely a lot of like user education we are doing with our potential like uh, like enterprise like with our current enterprise customers with our existing uh, small medium business customers to tell them like hey it's not gonna replace your job but it's gonna make your job more fun and better okay do you have any like stories of cool features that product teams have built based on the feedback that you know they've generated using your tool um, yeah I think we had like a fintech company uh, like a series A fintech companies. Uh, who basically just like connect us with their Zendesk tickets. Okay. And then he's saying like, okay, I, you, they get like a 10K feedback every month. And 10, then it took- 10,000 feedback a Okay, feedback. all right. And then it took him like two minutes to identify, oh, what is like run? What, is the credit card processing getting run? Uh, is the, uh, uh, yeah, I shouldn't like say too much about like what <laughs> <laughs> the product. What but, was wrong with the product, all right. Yeah, it just yeah. takes them like a couple minutes to identify what to work on next. Got it. Do you find the channel that most of the feedback comes in is Zendesk, social, you mentioned Discord, email, like is there one that almost all of it comes in for the companies that you work with or is it pretty broadly spread across those different inbound? Yeah, I think how companies like weighting the importance of feedback from different channels yeah. varies a lot uh, across like different type of companies. Uh, but for FinTech, it's pretty much like support tickets. Uh, for open source, it's like GitHub and Twitter. Um, so it depends. Like GitHub issues you guys can yep. pull in as well? Yep. Oh, okay. Super cool. Um, all right, Leisha. So game generation, uh, I've played around a little bit with your sort of asset and artwork generator. Like, do you guys find there's a particular type of art that people are using this for or a particular type of game they're using it for? Like, where are you finding product market fit among your customers? So what we've released so far just um, does asset generation, which is obviously only a part of the um, creating a whole game. Mm -hmm. So for that, we found that you know there's obviously a lot of art generation tools out there, so we have to kind of choose something very specific to have an edge, but eventually actually build out the entire pipeline you know, for the code generation as well. So some specifics are pixel art. It's actually okay. quite hard to create. Pixel art is hard to make. Yeah. It's, it is, uh, it's, it's funny because I feel like people do it naturally as indie developers because it might be slightly easier. Um, okay. But for these tools to kind of have in-game usable assets, you have to make sure that it's actually consistent. Um, sometimes people want to have choices to, um, you know, train it on their own um, assets so that it matches their mood board, and then just have everything done so that it's like backgrounds removed, transparency, um, actually have it be the size of the pixel art that they need it to be, and then also create sprite generation. So that's something like very specific we've Got it, on. and are sort of the open source tools or the available tools like you know, Midjourney or Dolly or Stable Diffusion, like, do, are they not able to kind of home in on the exact kind of art that people need for these projects? Yeah, yeah, I would say you know something like Midjourney, which is really excellent for concepting, has kind of got people sort of their feet in the in the door for starting yeah, to use generative. Yeah. Um, but we want to make it easier for, say, indie developer to really get to the in-game asset. And for that to happen, you have to do a lot more. And so, for instance, even sprite uh, animation, that's like a lot more than just generating an image, right? So you need it to kind of like fit um, and, and and do like an idle, uh, idle mode or like, you know, fight uh, mode or so, et cetera. And so making that really seamless and kind of almost a, you know, 
few click process is what we're aiming to do just with the asset generation. Got it. So you think the animation specifically really sets your tool apart, it sounds like, because you can't do that with most of the sort of third party generation tools right now? That would be one of uh, the things. I think in general, if I'm taking a step back, you know, asset generation is table stakes for helping gaming, and it definitely creates a lot of efficiency. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you want to go from concept to end product faster. Um, but actually, what's happening in generative is also a lot with the uh, the code generation, and so that's what we're building out right now. Which parts have. of the code are you generating? Like maybe all of all it. of it, all of the code. <laughs> You're just going to be able to generate games by typing in a few. A few well, key sentences. Yeah, how I see it is like, you know, right now you're building maybe for GPT-4, okay. but you want to be building for GPT-10. And so... <laughs> <laughs> Won't we all be dead with GPT-10, probably? <laughs> I <laughs> hope not. <laughs> That's my understanding of the future. Then why were uh, we building, period? <laughs> Hopefully not. I hope we're um, all uploading If we're the still alive, then. then I'm building yeah, for yeah, GPT-10 yeah. to generate the entire game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know people are signing petitions out there, and you're like... <laughs> yeah, I read yeah. some stuff yesterday uh, that I'm going to be dead at GPT-10. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If we're not dead, then we're, you know, making our own metaverse okay, and games. Okay, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, question for everyone, but starting with you, like, what's your, how does the business model work? Like, do I buy per asset? Is it a, you know, SaaS model, subscription? Like, what are, you know, how do you guys sell this? Yeah, it's pretty interesting. I mean, naturally, it'll be a SaaS product for the asset generation. Okay. But when I uh, think about uh, kind of creating the entire game, there's, uh, there's some very, like, if you want to attach the value created, I think, if you look at very successful um, products like Unreal Engine, they really attach it to the games that are, yeah. you know, they make over X amount of money. Mm -hmm. And so there's definitely some some things to be experimented on there yeah, as I well. Mean, you know, as a as a game maker, I would say, like, have you considered just making an amazing game with these tools and making it's, a ton of money? <laughs> it's a very different animal. <laughs> but when I say AI Roblox, I mean, in some sense, you're a platform for game sure. making, right? And so I want to focus on that problem rather. I don't think I'm going to be able to make that hit game, but I want to enable a thousand okay. X more developers to make hit games. Are you, last question on this front, I guess, are you making a Roblox, you know, mobile app, you know, console experience? Like, are you making uh, a piece of software that lets you play these experiences anywhere, or are you still sort of facilitating other people's creations right now? There's, I can't say a whole lot, except for there are some <laughs> frameworks that you can choose Come on, this is, to the, this is the event. <laughs> You've got to hype the future here. Yeah, well, it should be more accessible to open source type of uh, development. So I think there's a lot of like closed source engines like you know Unity, Unreal Engine. I think the, the choices that we're making are really trying to make it easy for indie developers to, to make something that's like easily accessible, shareable. So there's some biases towards the frameworks we choose there. OK, got it. Yeah, I mean, so pricing, I guess. Does anyone have interesting experiences where they've iterated on the pricing model, or they started selling it one way initially, or you know, anything, any anecdotes from your experience trying to sell into these businesses? Yeah. Yeah, maybe I'll go. Yeah. I mean, go for um, it. we're in the current YC batch. We launched, launched two months ago. OK. Um, we, we started. Do you have demo day in like three days? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. This is like a pre-demo day experience. It is. All right. It's good practice. Um, <laughs> um, so we started off like our lowest uh, pricing was like fifty dollars a month, going to I think like two hundred, and then like we had like five hundred. Uh, we're now at starting at six hundred a month, going to straight to like enterprise, and I think like that sort of like indicative of the kind of interest uh, that we've seen and the kind of like uh, just how much people get value from this because it's just a lot of work to be doing it themselves otherwise. So I think um, that's been a really interesting transition that we've seen. Do you find the pitch to enterprise more effective that I'm, you know, we're going to make your data team better or that we're going to save you money on your future data team at some point? So I think it's a couple of things. Yeah. One is that we're going to um, be your uh, like defense against any questions for your data okay. team. Right, so right, that right. they're a lot Not more waste productive. as much time. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And then the second I think is like let um, also a lot of these questions are directed to customer support often. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're helping save time there as well. And, essentially helping uh, them give their uh, customers a lot more value that they're just not getting now otherwise. Got it. Caroline, do you sell directly to doctors, or are you selling to hospitals, or how does, how does your business work? Yeah. Uh, oops. Sorry. <laughs> Mistake. <laughs> um, we sell both to doctors and also to um, healthcare administrators. So, I mean, we were in Y Combinator too, but last summer, um, I guess before the hype all happened. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what was that like, by the way, the, the hype transition between last summer Y Combinator and yeah. this Y Combinator? Well, I think Chun and I have maybe <laughs> an experience where, uh, I mean, it's definitely, um, it's exciting to be riding the industry wave, I'll say. I think it's just, we can build on top of the technology that everybody is 
collectively contributing to. Um, and then obviously the mainstream users are starting to hear about it more too. So it's just a phenomenal time to be building and selling, honestly. Um, but to your question, <laughs> we are uh, selling to both doctors and healthcare administrators because for us it's important to have both somebody, like a user who understands experiences and appreciates it, but also administration and healthcare is important for understanding the business value proposition. So, you know, clinical time saved or revenue generated, that's important too. Got it. So, you were also in Y Combinator last year. Like, I was. what has the hype experience been over the last six to nine months? Like, people walking up behind you in coffee shops asking to invest at this point, or? Oh know. yeah, I, I don't go to coffee shops. <laughs> oh no, yeah. you gotta, uh, gotta go to some of the, you know, you gotta be at Ritual in the middle of Hayes Valley, and I hear there's just term sheets flying there. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I mean, like, the interest is definitely there. Uh, when we were fundraising, like, the term generated AI was not even coined Didn't exist, there. yeah. Uh, it literally happened on the second week of us fundraising, and then everything just blew up. Okay, nice. Um, yeah. Good, good timing. <laughs> good timing. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, so I'm going to throw it out, sort of anyone who wants to jump in. I mean, I think one of the most interesting questions of this uh, conference is, you know, what third-party tools you're using, what's working, what isn't. You know, we talked a little bit about GPT versus Anthropic versus, you know, you're building your own model. Like, what are the, sort of the trade-offs around speed, cost, accuracy around your particular data set that you guys weigh, and, you know, how did you decide what tools to use and what you're using now? So anyone can jump in on this. Uh, I can jump in for this one. So our tech stack is like all over the place right now. Um, <laughs> and we're using like GPT 3.5 and 4 for like text understanding. Okay. Uh, and then AWS Comprehend for PII masking. Uh, so PII stands for Personal Inf Identifiable Information. Okay. Uh, and also just using some like customized triage model uh, to help like customers to triage their feedback. Okay. So it's like all over the place. I think like for startups at our stage, we just don't have time to really uh, evaluate every single offering right okay. now. Okay, yeah. Uh, so which is hard. Like, I mean, like, I wish I could have the time to pick the best one, but for us, it's the time is the most like, constrained there. Makes sense. Do you find GPT, I'm hearing four especially, is kind of slow and obviously quite expensive. Like, are you having any issues with that yet, or it's been fine for now? Um, I think the thing that with the right, just like putting the right model at the right <laughs> place in your tech stack right now. Okay. Um, yeah, GP4 is definitely like more expensive and like slow right now, but they will get better very soon, I think. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else got thoughts on models? I mean, for the image stuff, we have to do quite a bit of training and fine tuning on our own and nice. um, just kind of copy and paste a lot of things as well just to make sure that, because these things move so fast, it's ultimately what does the user want and then adapting that quickly. Um, but yeah, I mean, some things that we're experimenting with is we used to host our own infrastructure before you know everything kind of blew up and now there's a lot more infra providers, so we're okay. definitely experimenting with that. How expensive is it to train your own model for this kind of thing? I think for image it can actually be pretty cost effective because okay. for fine tunings it's a lot less than just training from scratch and for stuff that okay. you know you can... Um, I think for a lot of game assets, it's you can use start from open source and then fine tune on top of that. Okay, so you kind of get to jump start a little bit there. Exactly. All right, interesting. Um, yeah, anyone else dealing with cost versus speed versus you know specificity trade offs with the models they're using? Yeah, Caroline. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I'll echo what Leisha just mentioned that I think. Um, it's really important that we have just like reliability for our platform and then in healthcare specifically, patient, you know, privacy information, PII, we have to make sure that's um, all secure and encrypted at rest at transit. So um, I think for us, a long-term strategy is always to have our local proprietary models and then fine tune to the end user experience. It's really what the user is going to have. So for us, the doctor looking at it Maybe they want to have the, the notes turn around a really reliable time period. They want to process it all and complete them by end of day, right after the appointment. So, you know, the software can't be down um, it, in any kind of case. So I think building the local models and fine tuning it to the clinical workflows is very important. Yeah, I think we, we've had a similar approach. I think what's important for our customers is um, latency, reliability, and that speed of integration mm -hmm. um, as well. Uh, we found OpenAI's model is really good for early prototyping. Uh, we're also self-hosting fine-tuned open source models um, as well. And then when we actually deploy that to each customer, we're then fine-tuning that on their metadata and sort of their specific dictionary 
um, company specific dictionary and language um, as well. And we actually have like so it's it's not just a it's not just that text to SQL trans translator, but a bunch of different LLMs that we've chained together to work in sync. Got it. Interesting. So we've got a bunch of investors here. They all want to know who's going to win, the product companies or the people building tools and models. And I think you guys maybe are a little biased on this, but I'm interested to hear your perspective on this front. Who are going to be the best investments? The people who integrate AI into some sort of products or the people who are building the AI tools that let companies like yours function? Or both. You can go. You can give the easy answer if you want. <laughs> I think that's for investors to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, You're supposed to say your company is the best think, investment. Come on. Think, this is like a layup here. I think, uh, our, <laughs> I think our job as founders right now is to ignore the hype, keep our heads down, and build what our customers want, honestly. This is good PR training. All right. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Spoken like a true YC Demo Day uh, company. I, uh, I, also, I also used to be a journalist, so I've had some practice. OK, all right, all right, all right. Anyone else got a little spicier take on that front? <laughs> no? Oh, come on. All right. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think like one interesting question is, OK, I'll, I'll ask a slight variation that's a little bit less, uh, less direct there. Like, do all of your companies, do you feel like the kind of specific focus you have on a particular data set, which all of you have, is going to set you apart from these more sort of generalized tools going forward? And if so, like, how important is that differentiation? Are you worried about GPG-10 you know, getting good at medical terminology or something like that? Well, I uh, feel like yeah, that I was direct, pointed at me, this to you. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, I yeah. have to answer. <laughs> um, I think absolutely, like, we're very focused on our proprietary data set. Um, and for us, we're really unlocking a new, a new realm of data, truly, because medical data, you have a lot in electronic medical records now, but the conversation between a patient and physician, there isn't you know, kind of a widespread public data set for that. So that's something we're actually building for. Um, and so we can be on the cutting edge for our models and fine tuning. Got it. To your question on GPT-4, GPT-10, yeah. GPT yeah. I think, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how the models continue to evolve, but it won't be with the level of quality data that we're collecting ourselves. Got it. I mean, Chun, you mentioned when we were talking earlier about embeddings being a really key part of what makes, you know, sets your software apart. Do you feel like that's a long-term advantage there? Um, no, we're just using a unified embedding model uh, that okay. GPT has. All right. has. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, like I mean, like every VC can ask, like, what's your mode, right? Like, sure. And then founders keep asking ourselves, like, what's our mode? Uh, but I, <laughs> I do think, like, like startups. We're just a couple of months old, and then with the uh, change of like AI every day, like you don't know what's the new, like what what's the mode look like in the future, right? It might just be your distribution. It might just be people really love your product. It might be people feeling like oh, like before I was a pro uh, maybe like people feeling hey, with your tool, uh, I'm no longer only like an engineer. I can be do some product management work. Uh, I can do some data scientist work. So I think like to understand more about the user behaviors in the future, uh, that will be the key differentiator for this generation of startups. Got it. Alicia, yeah. any thoughts? Yeah. I think, yeah, for us, the choice is obvious to own sort of our own users and understand uh, their flows. So like we're not building just a feature of like asset generation. We want to make it a platform to make games. And I think that really future proofs it against any type of AI advancement because that is like something where we can absorb all of the benefits and the improvements in large language models and generative models. Awesome. Well, thanks so much to all the panelists. Uh, really excited to kick off today, and uh, let's all, let's all give them all a round of applause. Thanks. Thank you.